Good evening and welcome and thank you for joining us for our November's Huck event, which is delivered in partnership with the University of Worcester. This evening, we offer a warm welcome to Luke Connard, a local businessman who will be talking about his ups and downs of running your own business. There'll be an opportunity at the end to ask Luke any questions that you may have, so please submit these as we are going along. Uh, and without further ado, I'll hand you over to Luke. Uh, a warm welcome, Luke, to the Hereford University Centre, uh, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the welcome and, and thank you to uh, everyone that's uh, joining us and listening this evening. Um, right, uh, where do we start? I suppose the best place they say to start is at the beginning. Um, so uh, we'll go back to 1984. Um, now, just a, a little potted history. Uh, Great Britain had uh, just a couple of years before uh, won the Falklands War and uh, Margaret Thatcher had just won a landslide victory in uh, the latest election. And the UK was changing beyond all recognition. Um, you had, it, it was acceptable to make money. Uh, in, in the USA, it, it's always been, uh, people will um, uh, look up to people that are successful in business. Uh, people will uh, look, uh, congratulate people who are successful in business. But in the in the UK, making money has always been sort of a, a dirty business. Uh, but I think the most important thing that happened in 1984, for me certainly, was it was the third series of Only Fools and Horses. And one of my business idols, uh, Del Trotter, uh, was on our television screens again. And I'll come back to that later and explain why he is one of my business idols um, and not uh, Richard Branson or someone like that who is very good as well. Uh, but we'll come back to that later. Um, anyway, I just started secondary school at the um, Minster School, as it was called then, in Leominster. And um, we all know nowadays about how we sell things on eBay and uh, we've all been doing that for probably nearly 20 years now. But the uh, the, the, the uh, thing before eBay were car boot sales. They still happen now, but uh, in the uh, in the 80s, they were just starting. Uh, so people would uh, go along, set up and uh, sell their their wares, basically. Now, um, I'd always been interested in business. Um, my parents were both uh, teachers. Uh, my father, head teacher of Lord Scudamore in, in Hereford, and my mother, deputy head teacher of uh, Webley Comprehensive School. Um, and our family was a family of teachers and doctors, I suppose, apart from uh, my uncle Harry, who was a farmer in Leominster, and uh, my cousin uh, Martin Connard and his dad, who had Connod's garage uh, also in Leominster. And we, we were, we're really close family and family, I think, um, is really important and is really important to me and to the other members of my family. So we always had lots of family do's at Christmas, at Easter, at weddings and things like that. And um, the teachers and the doctors would all come to the do's and moan about teaching and doctoring and things like that. Um, but Harry would come to um, the do's being a farmer and um, he'd had a really successful harvest with potatoes and he was producing milk at the time and he'd turn up in his, his new Rover 3500 Vitesse which had a back seat that you could sit about 20 children on with plenty of room uh, and central armrest that was in the 80s was to die for. And then, uh, and with all fun stories from when he'd been at Rotary and the meetings and the trips they'd gone on and uh, the, the jollies and things like that. And then my um, cousin uh, would turn up and he'd always have a Range Rover. And I have always wanted a Range Rover classic. And he'd turn up in this Range Rover and he'd tell his business stories and um, the, 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 the sort of, the, the the scrapes he'd had uh, with the revenue and the, the conversations he'd had with the bank and and things like that and th these were just th they were the things that interested me um, and from coming from a family of teachers and doctors it was all very steady and and by the book but these were people along with the likes of Del Trotter uh, were people that had adventures and I saw business as 
being an adventure. So I wanted to, even at sort of 11 and 12, I wanted to uh, get involved in that. And um, my uh, mum and dad have always been fantastically uh, supportive of both myself and my sister. And so uh, we, we were fortunate enough to live in the country with a really big garden. Uh, and dad said, well, why don't you um, grow some plants uh, and um, I'll take you to the car boot sales and you can sell them out of the boot of the car. So I thought, oh, OK, then. So I um, invested some of my pocket money into a uh, polytunnel. Now, we've all heard of polytunnels uh, nowadays. They, they have a, uh, a, a mixed um, uh, a, a mixed PR. But personally, I like strawberries and it's great to be able to buy British strawberries from February right the way through till November. So I'm fully in favour. So I had a small polytunnel and I planted in the in the spring, some uh, marigold seeds, which I'd harvested from dad's garden the summer before, and uh, some, um, uh, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of them now, long lupins, lupins, that's it, lupin plants. So I planted all these up, oh, and some pansies as well. Planted all those up, and um, coming into the summer, they were all growing, so dad took me to the car boot sales, and we'd sell them there, and I think that was when I got my sort of taste for, for making money. Uh, we were at the car boot sales and selling the marigolds, but there was no one there selling um, rolls and sandwiches. And this was before the days of the five star ratings for hygiene and all these type of things. So it was perfectly acceptable for a 12 and 13 year olds to knock up a few ham rolls the day before and take them to a car, car boot sale without any fridges or anything like that. So I'm sure that's not quite how you do it nowadays. In fact, I probably hope it isn't. Um, so anyway, so I started making a few ham rolls and I bought a few packets of crisps and drinks and chocolate bars from Booker. Um, and I started selling those at the car boot sale as well, uh, along with the plants and they went down a storm. Um, and then I was thinking to myself, oh, this, is, this is all right, but I'm only going to the car boot sales on the weekend. So I've got these crisps and sweets and pop and things um, and they're not doing anything in the week. So what I did was uh, rented three lockers uh, from some friends of mine at school and had my locker and then put all the stock in that in the week and uh, was selling um, again, uh, selling at school. Uh, unfortunately, the school had a tuck shop, so it wasn't too keen on this level of entrepreneurship. Um, so after a couple of months, I was shut down. Um, but uh, that was OK, because at that point I then got a, um, a concession at Lempster Farm Supplies, whereby they were selling my plants uh, six days a week. Um, and uh, I deliver the plants to there after school. I'd go and just make sure they were all nice. Uh, and then they'd sell them all day long and then then pay me 65% uh, of the money and keep 35. So that was all good. And in the end, uh, myself and my mate Dean uh, Granger took over the tuck shop anyway. We were in, we're in sixth form, so it's fine. So um, then I, I was at school. We were at sixth form at this point. And uh, so I'd had a couple of part time jobs. I'd done the, 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 flat, uh, the market gardening business that had sort of finished by then. Um, and I'd worked at uh, Gateway in Lempster and then I got a job for Woolworths uh, in Lempster whilst I was at sixth form. Um, that was brilliant. I had the most amazing boss uh, called Eileen Creswell. And I started by sweeping the stockroom. And when I was good enough, she allowed me to sweep the shop floor, but she was brilliant. She really taught me, you know, um, how to do a job properly and do it well and take pride in whatever the job you were doing, whether it was sweeping the stock from floor, but really take pride in that. And I think that's sort of stayed with me to today. And, you know, it, it is important, whatever the job is, it's, it's, it's to take pride in it. Um, so anyway, so I was at sixth form at the same time and working about sort of 25 hours a week at Woolworths, uh, enjoying the, the money that brought in and the ability to buy myself um, a reasonably new car and uh, go down to the pub for lunch with my mate Dean, um, which was great because the, um, the teachers only went on a Friday, but we went to the pub about three days a week because the tuck shop was doing so well and uh, we were both earning money. He, he was working at the auctions and uh, I was working at Woolies. So it was all good. Um, and um, I was doing A-levels and I wasn't really keen on those, but I was really fortunate to be doing uh, an NVQ at the same time. It's one of the first 
years of um, BTEC NVQs. Uh, and I was doing one in business and it was absolutely brilliant. We had a great teacher. Uh, he really enthused us. And so I ditched the A-levels after the first year, carried on uh, with the NVQ, carried on working at Woolies and um, passed the NVQ at the end of two years with Flying Colours, which then enabled me to go on an apprenticeship with Woolworths um, to become a uh, uh, store manager. So I started on the apprenticeship, uh, moved to the Hereford Woolworths. Again, was really fortunate to have a really good boss, uh, Clive Fox, who taught me all that all there is to know really about running a shop, um, whether that be the merchandising, whether it be um, you know making sure that you look after the people that that you work with, how important it is to have such a great team, uh, and how important it is to innovate and never stand still. Um, and so uh, I, I was there for about uh, three or four years uh, and then I was again really fortunate to work for a company called uh, Cheetles in uh, Leicestershire. Uh, they had a shop in Hereford called Jean Station which was in Eingate just across the road from Woolies uh, so I didn't move very far um, but I got a job as an area manager for them so I was sort of traveling all over the south of the country looking after the stores there uh, and we're sort of in the um, early, uh, well, probably yeah, mid 90s here, I suppose, mid 90s. And uh, jeans have very much gone out of fashion. It was combat trousers that were in fashion. And we, uh, Cheetles had businesses called Jeans Station. So uh, jeans weren't in fashion and their business were called jeans. Um, so they decided to focus on their school uniform business, which was doing really well. And they said they'd got a couple of, uh, well, we're late 90s now, a couple of stores that uh, they were willing to sell. And myself and another store manager, he bought the one down near London and I purchased the business from them in Iron Gate in Hereford. Now, that wouldn't have been possible without the, uh, my parents. Uh, my father had just retired from teaching at that point and you get a very nice lump sum from teaching. Um, so I whipped that from under him pretty quickly. I invested that uh, in the business. Uh, and um, in 2001, we were, uh, I dabbled in online retailing for Cheetles from 1998, trialing it. But in 2001, we launched uh, our website by Jeans. Uh, .net. Now, uh, jeans were just coming back into fashion uh, and as everyone knows, the internet was just starting to grow. It had had its dot-com bubble in 2000 when everything had burst um, and Amazon were just starting to sell books and CDs and we've been doing it about five or six years then. And we were the first independent uh, retailer in the UK to sell jeans online. Now, um, I had all the brands come to me and say, oh, this won't work. Um, no one's going to buy clothing online. They need to come into a shop to try it on. What are you doing discounting the clothing? No one wants cheap clothing. They want to pay full retail price for it. Uh, and comments like, um, oh, we, we, we won't be selling online ourselves. We really don't think this will work. So I was tickling along in my little shop in Hereford with my uh, colleagues and our uh, jeans business was growing quite nicely. Then in 2003, the world changed uh, when Google started allowing you to pay for advertising and be at the top of Google. Uh, so we, we were one of the first retailers, definitely the first clothing retailer, independent clothing retailer in the UK uh, to do uh, Google ads. Uh, and so we went over to uh, Dublin to meet them in Dublin, went down to London to meet them in London. We were in all their focus groups. Um, and it was a really exciting time. And so 2003, uh, we started advertising and our business over two years increased by tenfold. Um, now, uh, that was amazing. And obviously I thought I was the kiddie because I'd done all this because I was Luke. I was fantastic. I'd be the biggest clothing retailer in the world uh, and didn't think actually it was just that we were paying for some advertising on Google and everyone saw us first. Um, so uh, we then had another exciting breakthrough that was all obviously down to me, nothing to do with anyone else, of course. Um, but we got invited by eBay to go and see them down in London and they want they were starting eBay daily deals. And um, so in 2005, we did our first daily deal with eBay um, and we sold 18,000 no, 18,300 t-shirts in one day on an eBay daily deal. 
So as you can imagine, at that point, that was it. I was going to rule the world. That was absolutely, that was the end, the end of it. Um, there was nothing I couldn't do. Um, I was amazing and, um, and business was going from strength to strength and it would just carry on that way. Because of course it would, it would never, would never stop. No one else would consider uh, selling what we were selling. We, we just, we just grow and grow and grow. Uh, unfortunately, then 2008 came along. Uh, the banks collapsed. Uh, the economy went into recession and just in the side door, Amazon started selling everything. So this little bookshop and CD seller that had just been selling books and CDs uh, realised that uh, we've been selling on Amazon at this point or, um, or on their marketplace. Uh, so what they did very cleverly, they got all these little businesses to sell on Amazon marketplace. Uh, they then looked at what the sales were. Obviously, as the little businesses, we thought the customers were ours, but, but you know, anyone that sells on Amazon and eBay, the customers are Amazon and eBay customers, they're not, they're not yours. Um, and so they looked at all the sales, looked at the product that was selling and went straight to the brands and said, uh, oh, we can sell that for you and we'll become your biggest customer instantly overnight. Would you like to supply us? Of course, the suppliers um, were very keen on that. Uh, and uh, so sort of in 2008, um, Amazon started selling the product themselves uh, and also the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the suppliers started their own website uh, as well. Um, so our business, uh, our online business, over about this period of three years, um, contracted by about 60-70%. Uh, we had concessions in outlets, we had 20 concessions at one point, as far north as, um, as uh, Newcastle and as far south as Dover and one, one over in Ireland. Um, that model, as the internet was growing, uh, was uh, not sustainable. Department stores were closing. Um, factory outlet centres were reinventing themselves because they weren't as cheap as they used to be. Um, so we had what well, I should put. I had all my eggs in one basket at that point, of course, because we just opened a new school uniform shop in Hereford and we just opened a new store called Fit in Hereford. Um, so we'd invested heavily into the business. Obviously, um, I thought I was indestructible, uh, as you always do. Uh, and we went through a very, very painful period uh, where I realized that I wasn't indestructible. Uh, it was market forces that had enabled us to grow so successfully and market forces were enabling us to contract very rapidly. And so I realized we needed to reinvent our business and um, we, I didn't need to rule the world. Uh, I didn't need to um, be this, you know, um, uh, the, the next Jeff Bezos or, or whatever. What, what I actually wanted was a really good quality of life in a wonderful county that we live in in Herefordshire and to run our business the right way. Um, so we started our journey with our school uniform business to become uh, the most ethical uh, and sustainable schoolware retailer in the UK. Um, and so we moved from suppliers that didn't have the same values as us. And bear in mind, this was sort of 2009, 2010. So this is before um, this is before ethics, fair trade and sustainability was uh, uh, ever any issue uh, in the clothing trade. It was just at the point where um, ActionAid had done a report on the manufacture of clothing it, uh, and how it was manufactured abroad. And that was really a turning point for us that we, we didn't want to be uh, in that, that type of business again. Um, so that combined with we knew we needed to add value to our jeans customers and make ourselves different um, to, uh, to everyone else. And a mate of mine, Heather Gorringe, who a lot of you probably heard of, said, well, you take jeans up in the shop, why don't you take them up on the internet? So I poo pooed her as I always do. And then she said it again and I thought, oh yeah, you probably are right. So what we did is we um, did the tech behind our website so that customers could buy a pair of Le Levi jeans, for example, in a 36 inch leg length, right down to a 26 inch leg length in one uh, inch denominations. So we were and still are actually the only jeans retailer that offers uh, tailoring uh, online so that you can buy the jeans. They come tailored in exactly your right, the leg length you require. And we're authorized by the brands to do that because, of course, we're messing around with their product 
Um, so it's important uh, that, that we get their authorization. Um, so anyway, Heather and I uh, had met at an e-tail group that was set up by uh, Mark Ellis uh, and Mark Edwards, uh, ex of M&M, uh, uh, about, uh, about 10 years before, I suppose, so no, probably about eight years before. Anyway, and we were both going through really tough times uh, in our businesses. There was a big recession. Um, the, the, the banking collapse obviously meant that the banks uh, sort of pulled their horns in, if you like, and weren't uh, quite so generous with the, uh, the borrowings they had been before. So it was challenging to be able to grow a business. And we both looked at our business, thought actually, well, I certainly did with mine, I think Heather did with hers. We don't want to have all our eggs in this one basket anymore. And we don't um, we don't want to be pushing ahead to be this um, you know billion dollar business that we were never going to well I was never going to be um, and flogging myself like a dead horse almost uh, to get there. Whereas actually quality of life, family and friends uh, you know are, are more important. Um, and so now that's so that's sort of 2014. Now it's easy to say oh, okay, uh, yeah we just turned it round, but. Uh, with any business, as anyone will know, it's a, it's a bit like a, an oil tanker. You can't just turn around and suddenly go the other way. You've got to make gentle changes um, and move the business in the new direction whilst keeping it profitability. And in my case, paying off a significant amount of debt uh, in the business as well. Um, so that for, for my business, that, that took till 2017. Uh, and we turned the business, we then won awards for our uh, ethics and our schoolwear retailer, and we're still the only um, schoolwear retailer that's been recognised uh, by um, the ethical uh, shopping award, and we've won that two years in a row uh, for our ethical stance on, on business as a whole. Um, and also we'd reinvented our online jeans business, so we had a unique selling point, which is the key with any business. Everyone was flogging jeans, but our unique selling point was you could have them tailored uh, by us. And that, that only started at probably about 5% of our business, but now it's 30% of our business. And we charge for this service. Uh, and we charge, I think it's nine pounds for a standard tailoring or 12 pounds for a premium tailoring. So not only does uh, does the customer get a wonderful product at a great value price because tailoring is more expensive than that, we actually get the extra margin as well. So it makes our business more profitable. And I'm sure everyone's, it's, it's an old business saying, but um, sales are vanity and profit is sanity. Um, I very much had quite a period uh, of vanity where I thought I could rule the world. Uh, and actually, I definitely prefer the sanity. Um, so our other goal um, as a business, we wanted to diversify. We didn't want all our eggs in this one basket uh, of retail. So we closed down the concessions. We got our warehouse in Hereford. We kept one concession at Labels because they're great and lovely to work with, with schoolwear and uh, denim, and that works really well. And we kept our school uniform shop in Hereford and our fit store in Hereford. What we did do is move from these uh, posh premises with big shiny windows and big shiny bills. So we moved our fit store to Widemarsh Street. Um, we opened three months before the new development opened. We rented the unit when we still do from Herefordshire Council at a fair rent and a fair rate. And by moving to that unit, we reduced our overheads by 80%. But because the new development had opened, our turnover actually is slightly more than, than in that store than it was uh, this year, probably actually this year, it's going to be slightly less because we have had a few months off as probably most of most of you know, the shop, you know, um, shopkeepers have had a little bit of a rest as they call it. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, so we had a few months off. So this year's turnover, I wouldn't say is anywhere <laughs> retail wise is anywhere near, but um, Last year's turnover, certainly we were turning over more in the old store and the same in the school uniform shop. And we operate that from um, uh, just opposite the Black and White House in an old nightclub called Manhattan's. Um, so anyway, back to 2017, um, Heather and myself and uh, Heather's husband, Phil and San uh, decided actually we saw all these people, a lot of our friends investing in property and it seemed like a very sensible idea. Now, we didn't have any big sums of money to go out and buy loads of properties. Um, and so we had to work out a way that we could get some money to buy some properties. Um, and that was by sourcing properties for other clients. So we would go out. Um, initially, we went, uh, we were looking at Newport and Hereford. 
and the, the uh, bridge, um, the seven bridge was about to come free. So Newport was absolutely ballooning, but every man and his dog were sourcing down there. And Hereford um, has grown significantly and the property prices in Hereford, as most of us probably know, are quite expensive. So we look just over the border and to the borders to Bilf Wells, Landridnod Wells, um, uh, Knighton uh, and over to Aberystwyth. And uh, we uh, sort started sourcing property for um, clients. And whilst we were sourcing property for clients, we were refurbishing it for them. We were making money from refurbishing the property and the sourcing fees. So that started us on our journey um, to buy property for ourselves. And um, we now we now no longer source for our clients. Uh, we just now source for our own uh, property portfolio um because uh, we, we've used that money as, as the if you like the embryo and also some of the profits from our businesses uh, to be able to invest in property and now the property we buy we buy for ourselves uh we, we do up for ourselves um uh, and uh, and then rent out um in february sort of bringing us right up to speed now in february this year one of the key building companies we worked uh, with uh went into liquidation halfway through a load of our projects uh which was uh one of those uh nightmare setbacks however uh although the guy that owned the building company um i can think of various names for him but let, let's just say he wasn't a professional business chap uh had some amazing craftsman that worked for him um, so we went to those guys and said actually look we want you guys to continue working for us we want to be able to give you the tools to do the amazing work we know you can do uh, and uh, so if we set up a building company will you come and work for us so in February uh, we set up Cherry Build which now uh, does all the building projects uh, for, for our uh, properties and also our personal properties and um, this sort of segues me on to the, the, the final uh, bit, which is the Swan in Letton. Now, um, uh, you would say uh, at the moment that uh, anyone would be mad to buy anything in um, hospitality uh, because you can't open it. I've been able to open it most of the year. There's lots of uncertainty, uh, but but when there's lots of uncertainty and when the market is its low, it is the right time to get into the market. Um, so my partner and I bought the Swan in Letton, um, which is where I'm sitting now, um, uh, back in uh, April this year. So we agreed to buy it back in sort of January, February, but we continued on with that and we wanted to set it up as a home as well as a business. So our business plan back in January was to only accept credit cards to have contactless accommodation, both in the letting rooms and in the campsite. And everyone said to me at the time, well, no one will understand that. Everyone in the country wants to pay by cards. And what does contactless accommodation mean? No one understands that. Now, since COVID, I think we all understand what contactless accommodation is. We all understand that we're paying by credit cards. And from our perspective, when we open the business, which is on the 2nd of December, fingers crossed, um, people will understand our business model. Uh, and so on the 2nd of December, our latest venture opens, which is the Swan at Letton, which has got a 40 cover um, bar restaurant. Uh, again, we're starting with small steps on the restaurant. We don't want to employ a chef from day one because realistically that's an expensive resource. Um, and we don't know, um, you know, whether we'll be closed for a bit in January, or February or whatever. Um, and so what we've done is we've partnered with um, Field to Fork, who do the most amazing pizzas. And so they're going to be doing a pop up for pizzas on a Friday and Saturday. And we'll open our letting rooms. We've got five really lovely letting rooms. If you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, you'll see the pics. Uh, they'll be opening straight away on Airbnb and Booking.com. They have their own separate entrance. It's totally contactless. Um, the, 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 it, it's what the customers want. Uh, we'll then open the campsite, which has got 18 pitches for tents, caravans and uh, motorhomes in March next year, just ready for Easter. Subject to the grass growing, that is actually, to be fair, because it looks a bit like the sawn out there at the moment. Um, but as long as the grass seed that we plant in February does a good job and the river Y doesn't wash it away, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be open for Easter. 
Uh, and then we've got a function space as well, which seats up to 60 and you can dress as you want. And we're going to do uh, build your own functions, basically. So you can pick from a menu uh, and um, you can pick what you want and that'll build your function, whether it be a wedding, funeral, bar mitzvah, um, uh, birthday party or, or whatever. Um, and the, the camping and caravanning, again, from my experience of camping and caravanning, is that um, actually what you want to do is turn up, plug in the electric, have a lovely shower, have amazing Wi-Fi, and not have to pay 50p each time you want it. So ours is going to be all-inclusive camping and caravanning. Uh, so you'll pay £25 a night. If you want to bring three kids with you, there's no extra for that. You want to have lovely hot showers in nice facilities, there's no extra for that. You want to do some washing, there's no extra for that. You'll have 120 meg download Wi-Fi, no extra for that. Uh, and no extra for your electric and water as well. Um, and so that's sort of our latest venture, which brings me back to Only Fools and Horses. Because, um, I, as I said at the beginning, Dale Trotter is my idol in business. And that's because of his values. Uh, his values are very firmly set in family and friends come first. He's always looking for the next big deal, yeah? Uh, whether that's the slow bus, if any own Fools and Horses fans, whether that's the slow bus to Chingford, uh, or whether that's um, the legacy that's, uh, that's uh, apparently, of uh, the frog's legacy that's apparently been buried in a graveyard somewhere by the seaside. But he's always looking for the next deal, but whatever he does, if you look at it, if you watch an Only Fools and Horses episode, whatever he does is family and friends come first. And in my business, if it wasn't for my family, my friends and my colleagues believing in me and supporting me, I, nothing would be possible. So that's it, really. I'd like to thank you so much for coming and listening. And apologies about the flickering lights. Uh, as with any refurb, um, we've got a few little um, uh, snagging issues and uh, the dimmer in this room I broke the other day. So it's not really a snagging issue, I suppose. Uh, it's it's cack handedness. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. That was really good. I really enjoyed that. And, um, uh, I'm quite local to Letton, so I am really looking forward to coming and visiting the Swan when it opens on the 2nd of December. And for £25, if I was a fan of camping and caravan, uh, caravanning, £25 a night is is, fan, is a fantastic offer, isn't it, for an all-inclusive um, uh, deal? So yeah, that I mean that I'm sure that's going to go down a storm, especially for the all-inclusive. Um, well, you've got five sumptuous letting rooms with oh. beautiful baths in the middle of the bathroom, oh. and you know, um, uh, super king-size beds with amazing mattresses. And <laughs> well, you uh, sold me. I'm only yeah. five minutes down the road, and I'm, so, oh, I'm sold. Yeah. I'll be I'll be down. I'll be down to visit. <laughs> <laughs> and no, my most brilliant. exciting thing, I nearly did a pope last week and kissed the tarmac because we had the tarmac yeah. put to the entrance. I was very excited about it. It's amazing time. seeing those changes, isn't it? And, and driving past and driving home every night, I see I see it changing <laughs> on a daily basis. So I am really looking forward to seeing that open up. Um, we have had some questions come in. So if that's OK with you, I'm going to um, ask those. OK. Um, so um, we've had a, an anonymous um, call, uh, sorry, question come in saying, what would you say are the main benefits of working for yourself? Um, well, uh, there, there are lots of negatives, but the main benefits are um, freedom to make freedom to make your own decisions, freedom to plan your own destiny, but more importantly, freedom to do those things. Um, so uh, if I, you know, if I wanted to go and take mum uh, out shopping. Uh, so my sister, my sister, my mum and my nephew all work in the business. Um, so Tuesdays are when mum goes and does her shopping. And so my sister, she takes her every Tuesday. It's, it's that freedom, I would say. Fre freedom, freedom to make your own mistakes <laughs> as yeah. well. I've made plenty of those, but freedom to plan your own destiny. Great, thank you. Um, and how do you determine whether uh, you're a capable, you're capable of starting a business? How, do, how does somebody, you know, sort of make those decisions on whether they are capable of starting a business? What would you, what advice would you give? I would say if you're prepared to work hard, and you have an interest in, in or a passion in what you do, then any anyone can run their own business. Um, it, it's it's all down to, to hard work and being passionate and believing in yourself as well. 
and surrounding your surrounding yourself with support surround yourself with the support of your family surrounding yourself with support of family uh, friends uh, and so you know um there are two things they say in business you need a good solicitor and a good accountant they're very important as well um and uh, i'm very fortunate to have worked with both of us for, for a long time uh, and um they they they've been very supportive but but i would say as long as you're passionate about what you do and uh, you're prepared to work hard at it um that then then that's the key because everyone will find in any in any business uh, you, you may think the market's saturated but actually there'll be a, a little niche you only have to look at the the beefy boys and bastion street feast and the burger shop in in hereford three amazing businesses with really passionate guys at the helm and we've already got two mcdonald's and a burger king so who'd have thought we wanted another burger um, I can't comment on McDonald's and Burger King, but I eat at Bastion Street Feast, the Burger Shop and the Beefy Boys and all their product is stunning. Yeah, I'd agree. <laughs> and that's the thing, you've just got to have that passion. You've just yeah. got to, you've got, you. some mornings you get up, you know, running your own business, you get up in the morning and think, oh, um, I have got a list of things to do today and they're not jobs I want. But most mornings I genuinely um, wake up excited about what's going to happen for the day um, and you know by the end of the week you, you look back on a Friday afternoon and you think yeah uh, you know we've achieved that this week. Brilliant thank you. Um, what drove you to carry on with the business during your lowest points you mentioned that you've had highs and lows during your your career what what um, what drove you to carry on? Um, a combination of um, sheer bloody mindedness that I owed my parents a significant amount of money and I wasn't going to let them down um, and um, that I knew I knew I I realized that I'd made mistakes I knew what those mistakes were and you've got you can't be afraid to look at yourself and think actually that was a really awful decision uh, for me the the biggest vanity product project was our fit store in uh, the centre of Hereford. Um, we opened that in 2009, I think it was. Um, we, uh, the rent was, the rent rate, all the bills before you opened the door were about £120,000 a year. Um, and I was moving from a business that was probably was £30,000 overheads. Um, I thought, was you know I thought I could do anything it was purely a vanity project um it was a lovely shiny shop with posh offices upstairs um but within three years we'd moved our offices to a a farm building uh, out of town and I couldn't wait to get out of the lease and move into something cheaper and it became one of the biggest headaches and biggest drains on the business um that, that we had I suppose it's finding those priorities, isn't it? It's, you know, it's 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 no, it doesn't do any any good to have a shiny office if you're not making the money, does it? So I suppose by moving to a cheaper premises to run the business, absolutely, you put instantly. more profit into the yeah yeah. yeah. I mean, business. our offices went from if you set the fit store and the offices together, the overheads went from probably 120, 130 grand a year down to um, twenty. 30 grand a year something like that wow. so yeah, you know huge. yeah the shop was still making as much money the warehouse uh which feeds all our internet business uh, the, the internet businesses um that was still doing well and that was growing um and, and it's also seeing an opportunity i mean um our online business we've invested massively in online this year because our stores have been closed for four months now and not yeah. taking any money and so we were really fortunate that we had an online business so we've we've invested in that this year to market that so that we can um and the turnover in online is, has grown massively our, our turnover is doubled on where it was last year in online if you like online retail which is going to be hard for the high street and me as a high street retailer you know I see it from both sides online has moved 10 years in 10 weeks the first lockdown it moved it forward 10 years in 10 weeks um but we were fortunate that we did have an online presence as well uh, and so the stock that we got we were able to sell through our online channels 
Uh, the next question actually is around online, so you may have may have answered it fully, but it, it says, do you, do you think starting an online business is the way forward in the current climate prior to going the whole hog and either renting or buying a business premise premises? I would definitely, uh, from, from our perspective, I, I would, um, we started our online business on the back of a business premise. So we never set up a business premises to, to run online. It, it was on the back mm. of, um, and so you only have to look at um, uh, Hamish with, uh, who's got Fields, they've got the, um, I've forgotten the name of the website now, that's annoying, but they've started an, an amazing online website, uh, championing, championing Herefordshire products. Uh, during lockdown and so that they've either they have started a business during lockdown I would say if I was starting uh, online again say selling jeans uh, it would be it would be tough to set up a website and sell on the website I think if I started again now I would probably start by selling on Amazon places like that to start with to build up uh, you're, they're never your customers, but to build up the turnover to be able to fund setting up the website and stuff like that, probably. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and somebody's asked, why is a business plan important and who should write it? <laughs> uh, well, this is very <laughs> controversial. OK, right. So there was a, my partner, Byron, used to, um, he, he uh, had a boss who was ex-army and um, he said uh, that uh, any plan never survives first contact. Uh, and if you think about it, it's very true in the army because you actually you know, don't know what's going to happen. It's very true in business. No plan survives first contact. Uh, a business plan is important because you need something to show to the bank so that they believe in you and you need to have in your mind where you're going to go. So writing that down on a piece of paper is really important. But don't once you've got started and once you're off down the road, don't let that piece of paper rule your life. If if you know if anyone had said said to me um, I'd be running a building company 12 years ago, 12 months ago, sorry, I'd have said they're absolutely ridiculous. But as it happens, that is that's really good and it, it fits in with our property you know, business well. Uh, and we, you know, for the pub refurb, for example, we, we've been able to do through our own building company. So we've saved us a sort of significant amount. Or, well, you haven't saved money. What you do is you go for a better finish. Um, so you never really save money. You just get the better finish, which is nice. Um, but yeah, don't, don't a business plan is vitally important for your funders, your bank. They, they love to see them. Um, and so that you understand in your mind what your plans are. But if your business sort of veers slightly and actually something else is working better um, uh, than the business plan, then, then it's OK to go in a different direction once you're on that road. Okay, thank you very much. And um, we've got another one for you. For someone in a secure, employed but unhappy rut, what would you advise about the risks of starting a business? One big step or gradual steps? Um, um, gradual steps. If I was, I, I don't know, it's obviously this person's sort of background, but um, if I uh, if I was employed now and looking to start a business, um, I, I would see if I could um, start the business while still having the security of being employed so I could test the water, uh, particularly if I had a family with a young family or something like or a support or something like that. So I could test the water, I, not affect my core job. And obviously, if it's in direct competition with your core role, for example, your uh, uh, I, I don't know, a sort of a, a designer or something, and that's what you want to do, um, design product, you know. A, a, say you're a photographer working for a photography business and you want to set up your own photography business, you wouldn't, that, that wouldn't be ethical to, to do it that way. But if your new business was something different, I'd definitely start as a kitchen table business to start with um, and sort of, you know, give it a test drive basically and see if it works before before I took the, the big step. Having said that, uh, a friend of mine um, started out in business last year and he took a massive leap. He just got two kids, a new wife, and, you know, he took a massive leap for working for himself, himself and he's done a phenomenal job. Um, and he's going from strength to strength. So you have to admire, you know, his gumption, as it were, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose it's recognising those um, opportunities as they yeah. arise and, and take and, and whether you're brave enough to take those risks, isn't That's, it, really? Yeah, as yeah. Del Trotter said, um, you have to uh, realise every opportunity, whether that's an opportunity as a hole in a barn door or uh, 
you've got to, you, you look at the you look at the all, the all joking aside about fly pitchers and stuff like that but they are the ones that recognize the opportunities so the guy that started selling face masks in the vending machines in london he you know he went on that opportunity and and grabbed it with both hands and it it's you know it, it, it's supply and demand in 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 all elements of business really um he, he saw that window of opportunity mm. so yeah, yeah definitely um Luke, do you think that um you're focused more on buying property now and and sort of not diminish the retail but but focus more on property and go that way or will you keep both going uh the pl my um plan is to uh have the many strings to my bow so keep uh, keep both going i'm really fortunate in the 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 denim nation side of the business um that well i'm really fortunate in all the sides of this have an amazing team but in denim nation particularly because we've worked together for nearly 20 years now the team um to be honest they just get on with it and mostly i just get in the way uh, a bit like old Mr. Grace and are you being served? I bumbled down and asked them if they're doing very well. Um, go away. I think I came into the office yesterday morning, so I've been on the build of the pub for quite a while. Came into the office yesterday morning, went online, slowed the internet down so much uh, that it was best I went home again. So, <laughs> well, it's sad that you've got a team that you can rely on, isn't it? Just to oh, let the place, place run. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, amazing. Sorry, really. sorry, sorry, Luke. No, no, no. Um, I think that's all of our questions for this evening. So um, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, like I say, I look very, very much forward to the um, the, le the Sun at Letton opening up on the 2nd December um, with, um, well, unless there's any other news from Boris, I suppose, but hopefully, hopefully the 2nd of December will be the, the date that that opens. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's been really good. I've really, it's really been really enjoyable. So thank you very much. No, thank you all for listening and thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Luke.